This is a story about how I was almost kidnapped by a coworker. Who knows what he was planning? You tell me. When I was in high school, I worked for a family-owned plant nursery and garden store. At the time this took place, I was a cashier and had been working there for two to three years. It's important to note that while I was in high school, I also attended a vocational school. The students at this vocational school came from all over the county, so it wasn't uncommon to have friends or know people from a few towns over. The place I worked was a perfect spot for a teenager to get a job. There were a good mix of adult employees and teen employees and was a fantastic place to work. During summer one year, a boy started working there. For the sake of the story, I'll call him Connor. I recognized him from the vocational school we attended. We got a bit friendly at work, but I would have never considered him a friend, just a co-worker, acquaintance. To be honest, I always had an off feeling about him. His mannerisms and actions just made me feel uncomfortable. But I had no reason to be mean or dislike him because he never gave me a reason to. It's hard to explain, but I just got a gut feeling of some kind. Before I go any further, I want to give a little more context about my job. To get to work and home, I took a bus or got a ride from my dad. The bus stop was about a 15 minute walk from my job and the ride included a transfer at some point. If the buses were on time, it was a 25 minute commute. With rush hour and late hours and full buses, it could take 45 minutes plus. My dad only really drove me to and from on the weekends. After a few weeks, the more interactions with Connor, I started to get the feeling that he liked me. Whatever register I was on, there were multiple throughout the store. He'd frequently make passes at and sometimes even stop to chat for a minute. I always maintained a friendly coworker vibe and did not do or say anything that may have made him feel different. One day, he asked if I wanted a ride home. I found this odd because I didn't think he had a car as I always saw him skateboarding to work. I just declined and we went about our day. The next weekend he asked again and again I declined. I asked if he had a car and he said no but he could ask to borrow a car from his parents and drive me home. I told him that wasn't necessary. I didn't mind taking the bus and it just so happened that my dad was picking me up. This exchange probably happened five or six more times. You gotta give it to him. This boy had some persistence. Every time, I politely declined, but after the third time, it started to creep me out. In my high school, teenage girl mind, I thought I was making it pretty clear that I wasn't interested in spending more time together. The last time he asked, I caved. He asked early in the morning. It just so happened that day, it was planned that my dad was going to pick me up from work, but he had told me on the way to work he wasn't going to be able to. I can't remember why. Something with his girlfriend, I'm sure. Anyway, I was feeling pretty bummed about having to walk and take the bus. If I remember correctly, it was supposed to thunderstorm all day. Connor came up to me as I was opening my register and said, Hey, I finally got my own car. I was happy for him as our conversations at work in the recent weeks were about his parents possibly bringing him car shopping soon. We talked about it and I congratulated him. Then, he asked if I wanted to ride home that day. At this point, I was honestly fed up with that. I thought, what the hell? Maybe if I say yes and let him drive me home once, he stopped asking, so I agreed. The day goes on and eventually lunch rolls around. I take my break and end up going to eat in the break room. When my break was almost over, another employee comes up and starts talking about how there was a couple cop cars in the parking lot with their lights on and two officers went into the admin office. The rest of the story is what I pieced together from what the others told me. The local police made occasional drive-bys of my place of employment. The owners had some family friends who were officers, and they looked out for them. I guess on this day, that family friend cop did a drive-by and noticed a car in the parking lot that had been reported stolen that morning. He pulled over to investigate. I guess at this time, when another officer pulled up, a backpack was spotted, very crappily hidden behind a nearby tree. They do some investigating, 
found some things along with an ID, and went into the admin's office. The police officers tell them what they found, and Connor is called back to speak with them. It turns out Connor had stolen his uncle's car that morning. The backpack that was found had his ID in it, along with a rope, duct tape, and a switchblade. When he was called into the office, his uncle and parents were called. I guess his uncle said that he didn't want to press charges, which is why Connor didn't leave with the police. The boss asked Connor to leave for the day, and he did. I don't know if he was questioned about the contents of the backpack, and if he was, I don't know what his answers were, or the reasoning for having all those things. No one knew that he was going to give me a ride home that day. I hadn't told anyone. It wasn't until after things went down that I told my mom. Connor didn't work there long after that. The whole thing creeped me out so bad, I made it a point not to run into him at the vocational school. I remember using humor as a coping mechanism of the whole weird thing. Oftentimes, my mom and I would joke around about the guy who was going to try to kidnap me. I only remember this now because two or three years ago, I was scrolling through Facebook when I came across a shared memorial post. I recognized the face, and when I checked the profile, it clicked where I knew that face from. It was Connor. I had blocked this kid, and this clearly traumatizing experience out as well. I completely forgot about him, his name, that we worked together, what happened, and by this time, it had been eight years. After some digging, I learned that he had died from a drug overdose, and on his profile, it had his previous place of employment, one being my old job. This made me message my mom. I texted her and said something along the lines of, Do you remember Connor? Are you serious? What? You mean the guy that was going to kidnap you? That was all she had to say. I had a crazy flashback. I was so surprised and concerned that I could block out something like that. I'm clearly still trying to process it. It's been two years since the conversation with my mom. But anyways, this is my creepy encounter. So this actually happened about two hours ago. I, 26 female, and my boyfriend, 36 male, decided to go to the store to get oil. We have to go out 45 minutes just to get this out in a bad part of the city. But it's the only European store that actually has the stuff I grew up eating with. My family and I are from Ukraine, but I live in US and it's difficult finding authentic places that have exactly what we had and this is the only place I've found that has it down to the exact brand. As we are driving, we are on a three lane road, which we need to get into one of those mid-section U-turn type of lanes. We get into the left turn lane, and a black car blitzes from the right lane through the middle lane to cut us off at the left lane, which my boyfriend and I were like, what the fuck? And then they stop at the green light for a U-turn. My boyfriend honks twice in a nice way, in case they were just on their phone, to let them know to go since it's green. They go forward and we go to the parking lot, directly on our right to the store that we need to go to. The car that was in front of us, which is now in the far left lane, goes through another two lanes and drives onto the sidewalk to go into the parking lot where we were going into and rides nearly on our bumper, pressing their horn the entire time we drove. My boyfriend eventually decided to stop a few feet further than the store instead of parking at it. At this point, I realized the car camera was not on. I can't remember the name in English. It's a camera that records in the front and back as you drive. I tapped it since it usually starts recording when it feels motion. It didn't turn on and we realized it somehow disconnected to his car. As he's trying to get the camera plugged back into the car, the black car pulls up and I see three guys looking 18 to 20 in there. All three were African American. They rolled on the window and the driver reaches for something, about to take it out. And I'm screaming at my boyfriend, just drive, go, just go. And my boyfriend slammed on the gas pedal and we drove off and the black car does too. My boyfriend suddenly began doing donuts in the parking lot to get their car off her back while I'm screaming. Oh God, oh God, the police, call the police. I need to call the police. 
I managed to dial 911 and he's doing the last donut and then suddenly began driving out of the parking lot. The black car was still chasing us out as I finally got an answer. When the police asked where we were, I blanked out and shuddered in panic that we were currently being chased and my boyfriend yelled out the road that we were passing. He used to do Uber for seven years and knows every street name by heart. Those guys kept going after us until we were about three to four blocks away from the police station and they probably realized where we were going and swerved to a random road to our left. At some point we got disconnected but the officer called me right back and stayed with us until we pulled into the station. We explained what happened and the officer was nice. He offered to escort us back to the store and follow our car just in case the guys were still there. We showed the skid marks. The officer said, nice, as a joke. It was all good. He did his paperwork and we grabbed the sunflower oil I wanted and had my boyfriend try authentic Slavic ice cream for the first time, which he agrees is 100% better than American. We decided to cut our day short, thank the officer and went home. My boyfriend said he was amazed on how quickly I made all the right decisions and was surprised I even called the police because he's aware I have a history of being sexually assaulted by two on-duty officers four years ago and I've been terrified to speak to officers since then. But I was so terrified of getting shot and my only priority was to have the police over so my boyfriend is safe if something happens to him. I was so terrified, my chest hurt, and I'm so happy we are safe. I genuinely hope I never run into those three guys ever again. Let's not meet. Trigger warning for this story as it has animal cruelty and domestic abuse. I'm a female 22 at the time of writing this. I was almost killed by my ex-boyfriend, male, about 30 now. I will be changing names as to protect myself. I'll start with a quick backstory. At the time of the attack, I was 19, almost 20. My ex, Gavin, was 27. We had a big chow and a cat, the dog being his and the cat being mine. We lived in a three bedroom house the layout being you walked in and to the right is the living room. In front of you is the dining room and off to the left was the kitchen. Open concept living and dining room. Closed kitchen. Down a longish hallway we had a bathroom to the right and the main bedroom at the end of the hall on the right. Then two other bedrooms on the two other walls. A few months before we had allowed our friend to stay with us, Lacey and it didn't end well as she was just taking advantage of us. The week leading up to the attack, Gavin had gotten back from a work trip, which I believe was about three to four weeks away from home. The week he was back, he was completely out of it, not being able to complete a thought. I'd ask or tell him something, and less than five minutes later he'd completely forget, or just not have heard me, like he was just off in some other world. One day I was very frustrated with this as I asked him to help me with chores or for him to take out the garbage only to be ignored. He said that if it continues that he wanted me to slap him. We had gone out to dinner with his mom two days prior to the attack and she was obviously very worried about him as there was clearly something wrong. At the time the only mental disorder he had or was aware of was OCD which now I'm even more convinced that that is not what he had by any means. The day of the attack we had just gotten back from grabbing some takeout and were sitting on the couch in the living room. I'd been painting my nails and he was playing Mario Kart. He looked over at me and said, Lacey put a curse on my family. I was dealing with my own poor mental health at the time, so I wasn't really in a space where I could be focusing on his. I wasn't really sure what to do so I just suggested that he hop in a cold shower as it helped him earlier in the week to just reset a bit. He walked into the bathroom and was muttering to himself and it just felt so off. I don't know how to describe it. I didn't feel safe. I walked over and asked if I can call his mom for him maybe to invite her over for supper. 
kind of beating around the bush that I wanted her to come and help him. He looked at me and just started yelling that all he needed was me. I walked out and started for the living room as I was calling his mom. He came out of the bathroom naked and started yelling at Ollie, the dog, to discipline me and attack me. Mind you, he was a trained guard dog. At this point, I believe his mom had answered the phone and had heard what was happening. He started to call me lazy and I needed to pay for what I did. I ran into the bedroom with my phone, still with his mom on the line. He kicked down the door and smashed my head into our mirror closet door and threw my phone on the ground. He was screaming that he was going to kill me. I scrambled out of the bedroom door trying to get to the front door. As I was passing the kitchen, he got a hold of me and wrapped his arms around my throat, again saying that he was going to kill me. I remember looking over to the table and seeing my cat, Sterling, all puffed up. I've never seen him so scared. I was fighting not to go unconscious. I couldn't breathe. I clawed at him, just trying to get his arms off my throat. I remember starting to see black specks in my vision and thinking that I'm going to die. What is he going to do with my body? He asked me if I knew what it was like to be raped. This is the part where I'm not sure if he was actually out of his mind as I had been raped before and it was a year that month. I was very open about how that had been affecting me. He threw me to the ground and put his foot over my head as if to stomp on it. This was the only time I had seen his eyes throughout the entire attack. They were almost lifeless, his pupils so dilated you could barely see the iris. He was yelling over and over again, admit it lazy, you know what you did, admit it. I just started apologizing, doing and saying anything I could to make him happy. It seemed to have worked as I got the opportunity to scramble to my feet and race out the door. I just wish I left the screen door open. I ran from house to house in nothing but shorts and a sweater in February in one of the coldest provinces in Canada. I got to maybe two or three houses before I heard Ollie screaming. It's a sound that I can never get out of my head. I just dropped to the ground screaming and crying. Gavin, leave him alone. I knew he killed the dog. At that point, a bunch of neighbors had heard the screaming and came running to help. An older couple called the police and brought me into their home, not knowing if they were putting their own lives at risk. My parents were living in a completely different province. Someone gave me their phone to call my mom. She was out for supper with some friends and I just told her that Gavin killed the dog and tried to kill me. The police finally showed up after what seemed like hours. Five to six cars, firearms out. They used a megaphone to tell him to come out with his hands up. He walked out naked and covered in blood. Once they had gotten him into the car, a police officer came to talk to me while the others searched the house. Shortly after, an officer came up and asked me how many dogs we had. I told him one and one cat. I asked if Ollie was still alive and they told me that he was dead in the bathtub. Gavin had killed him in the living room, then brought him into the bathroom, filled up the tub, and put Ollie's body in it. I had asked about the cat and they said they couldn't find him anywhere just yet. I was sure that he had killed my sweet boy too. Sterling was the only thing I could think about and I went into panic and was no longer able to give them any more information as I was basically in tunnel vision. Where's my cat? I want, I want my cat. Find my cat. The officers asked if there was any treats that would coax him out and where his hiding spots were. They ended up finding Sterling alive but scared and they couldn't get to him as he was so scared and was attacking the officers. They had blocked off the worst of the scene, so they had me go in and get Sterling. As much as they blocked off, there was still so much blood, and the smell of the blood and feces were overpowering. Sterling was in the bedroom, on the bed, just crying. I scooped him up and asked the officers to find my vape. As I was walking out of the house, Gavin's mom had gotten out of her car. 
She asked me where Ollie was, and all I could say was, Gavin killed him. She dropped to the ground and started bawling. I just walked past her and put Sterling in her car and sat in the front seat, not sure what to do, as I didn't want to go with her. At that moment, I hated her for what her son did to me and Ollie. To this day, I regret how I acted towards her. I had no right to be so cruel to someone who was also now suffering. My mom had gotten a hold of my aunt that lived a few towns over, so once I was done with the officers, I was to go with her. Once the police were done doing whatever it was that they were doing in the house, I had to go back in to get some clothes and such. They had forgotten to close the bathroom door. Luckily, I wasn't the one that walked by it at first. It was Gavin's mom. The sound she made was horrible. Eventually, my aunt came and I went with her. The next day, I had to go back to the house to get my things, and the police had gotten someone to take care of the body, but not the mess of blood and the body fluids and pee and poop. Half of the stuff, I didn't know what it was. His mom and sister had came to clean the house, blood everywhere, and a lot of broken furniture. His mom was kind enough to clean all my bathroom things and throw anything that couldn't be saved. Unfortunately, I had African black soap. That night, I washed myself with it, and when I looked down, I was washing myself with a bar of soap caked in Ollie's blood. Two weeks later, Sterling and I were on a plane to my mom. The court case took two years, and I only found out later that he had gone to load his guns. For the longest time, I didn't want to know how he killed Ollie, but when they were going through the evidence, an officer mentioned a baseball bat. He only got 10 months house arrest. To this day, two years later, he still tries to contact me, blaming me for not getting him help. I think the worst part is I do partly blame myself. Not just for not knowing to get him help, but also for not leaving the door open for the animals and for bringing that baseball bat into the house weeks prior because I was too lazy to walk to the shed. Let's never meet again, Gavin.